chanter. One of the great things about this summit format as a MC or host or editor, whatever I am, is you get a second bite at the cherry and you listen to the next session and you think, that's what I wanted to say. And I had a series of them over the past hour. Um, just obvious, brilliant things about EVs that have been so embedded in my brain, even though I don't own one, I just, I just want to for so long that I forgot to say them in the, in the first session. Air quality, they leave your air breathable, right? They're quiet. They, well, they're gonna transform whole areas of the map by making streets quiet where they used to be loud. Um, the, the, the negligible cost of charging. Do you remember how much money do you spend in filling up with petrol? No more. Uh, and you can do it at home. And uh, somebody made a great point in the last session. And I'm sorry that I'm taking advantage of my ability to pick up on things. Uh, uh, most journeys are really, really short. We're over-engineering EVs and um, uh, a 30 to 40 mile range is sufficient for most. Anyway, that is not the subject of this session. We're gonna talk about autonomous driving because a bit like, for me at any rate, the original surge in excitement over the potential uh, for EVs about five years ago, among people who were not already uh, up to speed on the subject, like me, there was a big surge of excitement about driverlessness, autonomous driving, uh, at least in the in the UK press, and uh, a, a kind of a bipartisan uh, wave of excitement about its potentialities, how it was going to change everything, and how we were heading inexorably for a future in which driverless cars were summoned by app on demand um, and took us where we wanted to go and, and then just uh, retreated to like a, like, like a robotic butler to a parking spot that we never saw. And then the practicalities of getting there turn out to be somewhat complicated. And we have, uh, some people have said, uh, arrived in the trough of disillusionment. Um, but to pick up on James's point at the, at the end of the last session, the, the risk of uh, in, in these forward looking uh, summits of thinking 10 years ahead and not two years ahead. Um, I want to start this session with Matthew Avery, who's head of research at Thatcham Research, right at the cutting edge of working out the regulatory realities of autonomous driving. Uh, we had a, a, a quick chat before this call, Matthew, in which you were saying that actually, even though some people in the last session said full autonomy is, is 10 years hence, aspects of it, a degree of autonomous, is practically with us now. Can you just describe uh, what you said to me about where in the UK we're going with autonomous this year? And, and then perhaps get to this mismatch between expectation and reality. Yeah, sure. So uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm from Thatcham Research. Thatcham Research is a not-for-profit insurer-funded research centre looking at automotive safety, repair and theft. And a lot of people know Thatcham for alarm systems and they think we make them, we don't, we accredit them. A lot of what we do is around vehicle safety. We do a lot of work with Euro NCAP and we're members of Euro NCAP. We do the safety star ratings on cars. So autonomous driving is very, very uh, important for us. So in terms, of, in terms of vehicles, vehicles are obviously regulated. The reason you've got white lights at the front and red lights at the back of all cars is because there are regulations. And a lot of those regulations come from uh, the UN and we're part of the UN process, what's called the ECE. Um, and they've been working on automated driving regulations for some years now. A lot of argument, a lot of discussion about what we can do. And uh, in your sort of run up to this presentation, you showed a slide that showed the SAE levels from zero to five. So there are these six levels that define what automation is. And it starts at zero with no automation, level one, the sort of systems we've got like ACC, level two, which is our current state of the art, which is where a vehicle supports you in steering and braking, and you can use on a, on a motorway. 
And, and that's a very good system of system within your NCAP. We rated last year and we've got lots of vehicles with assisted driving systems. Key thing is there, you are still the driver, you are still liable, you have to watch what's going on, but the vehicle is supporting you in terms of steering and braking. We then move on sort of level three. Level four is full autonomy where you can press a button, probably go to sleep. And in a certain ODD, what we call the operational design domain, let's say a motorway, you can push the button and do whatever you like because the car is going to do all the driving for you. Level five, full autonomy, is when you have autonomous vehicles. You get in the car in your drive, press the button, tell it where to go, and it will take you the whole journey. So it's not limited in its operational design domain. That sort of thing is a long way off. Now, I've missed out level three because level three is the first step to autonomy where effectively you can allow the vehicle to do all the driving uh, on a certain operational design domain, but you have to be ready to take back control. And there's a sort of a dichotomy here because of course, people think with autonomy, the car can do everything you can do and it should be able to handle everything. Well, in most cases it can, but it's going to require you to be ready to take back control. Now, talking about regulation, in January this year, the UN passed a regulation called 157, if you want to look at it, R157, and it's basically about something called AUKS, A-L-K-S, Automated Lane Keeping Systems. And effectively, there's a system whereby you're on a motorway, if the car allows you to do, you press the button and the car will automatically keep you in lane and keep you a safe distance from the car in front. Now, assisted driving systems will do that today and they use radars and cameras to judge those things. The difference is you are no longer liable and you can do what we call secondary tasks. You can watch TV or um, do email in the car. You can let the car do the driving. Now, the car is going to require you to take back control if once you come to the end of the journey or if something happens in front of the vehicle or the weather's bad, et cetera, et cetera. The car cannot move lanes and the car also initially will be restricted to 37 miles an hour. It's an odd number, but it's actually 60 kilometers per hour because that's the way the regulations are um, uh, written. So this is about you being able to sit in a queue, queuing traffic on the M25 on a Friday night, push the button, and you can watch TV uh, until um, the vehicle, you know, the, the traffic picks up speed and you'll have to take back control. Now, the government are very, very keen on autonomy, the UK government, and uh, the Transport Secretary in November has already said um, they would like to encourage the uh, uptake of these systems and therefore they're actively looking at introducing this on UK roads later this year. Now the first vehicle is already going through this type of approval process which is the new Mercedes, the W223 to me but that's the new S-Class Mercedes and that will be the first vehicle with this system. Now, it's got drawbacks. It can't move lanes. It can't swerve out of the lane. Um, and it won't, if the driver fails to take back control, do anything but stop. All it can do is say, well, I can't continue, so I'm going to stop in lane. And there are obvious issues around stopping in lane. So whilst these systems are going to be very robust and very safe, they are limitations. And there's a disconnect between the expectation of the consumer, which is, an automated car, right, I can get in and go to sleep and let the car do the driving. And actually reality, which is you've got to be there ready to take back control. So limited automation will be with us just later this year if you can afford it. Matthew, thank you very much. Fernando in the chat is saying Mercedes, the first vehicle. What about Tesla? There are 100 steps ahead already. W what is Tesla's status in the eyes of UK regulators? Uh, a Tesla is an assisted driving system. Um, I know Tesla market the vehicle as automated. They use the term autopilot, but they'll say in the small print, their system is an assisted driving system that requires the driver to keep their hands on the wheel and the eyes on the road. And because of regulation, if you drive a Tesla in the UK or Europe, it will tell you every 15 seconds to put your hands on the wheel. 
And a lot of manufacturers have got very similar systems. So Mercedes have got a very similar system. Volvo have got similar systems. And in fact, we tested the assisted driving ratings in our Euro NCAP testing at the end of last year. And the Tesla was part of that. The best one we found actually was the Mercedes because the Mercedes involves the driver, encourages the driver to stay in the loop. The problem potentially with the Tesla, of course, is it encourages the driver to sit back and let the car do the driving. When we come to autonomy, even level three autonomy, that's fine. But in a level two assisted driving, the driver must maintain their role in the driving task and therefore they have to be in the loop. And therefore, the assisted driving systems like Tesla sell today, they might be very good, but they are still assisted driving systems and still require the driver to be ready and always monitoring the situation. They're never sitting back watching TV. Thank you. Uh, and I notice Andreas is saying, what about Waymo in the chat? And Andreas, um, we're going to get to that, I hope. And uh, indeed, the, the whole 10 years hence, or, or contemporary in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, in just a bit. But uh, Matthew, bef bef before we go to Professor Jack Stilgo, I want to come back to you on the organic, which seems to be the word of the day, growth of regulation around autonomous uh, driving in this country. Um, you make the point that the UK government is broadly in favour, anxious to push ahead. Heaven knows we've had enough of this um, characteristic of this government um, ambitions to be world leading, even when we're not actually building any autonomous technology. Um, does this create a risk of regulatory chaos uh, as um, manufacturers are have, have products approved before the public in general knows what's coming? I think there are safety issues around implementing this technology too quickly and the lack of clarity. We have done studies asking consumers about what do you want in an autonomous car? You know, can you buy an autonomous car? And about 70% of people think you can buy an autonomous car already. There is a huge mismatch and you know, your, your comment before about, well, Tesla are way ahead. Yes, Tesla appear to be ahead. Their marketing suggests that how far ahead they are, but actually, again, they are constrained by what they can do. And it's very important that consumers understand how to use this technology correctly. Now, the, the insurers and Thatcher are very, very pro automation. They think automation is a great thing. It will bring huge benefits. Um, but that is, under, that is automation used correctly in terms of the driver then is understanding the limitations of the system and, um, you know, follows it correctly. In other words, if they're allowed to go to sleep, then they go to sleep. And if they're not, they don't. But the consumer won't really understand that. The consumer expectations are the car's automated. It's got autopilot. It just does itself. I can press the button. I can do what I like. And in reality, you won't be able to do that. Now, another sort of point, um, and it links in with your previous webinar around electrification. And of course, the two things go hand in hand together, automation, and electrification. And one of the reasons is not only is this the sort of new economy and the new design of the vehicles, it's the fact that vehicle manufacturers are engineering electric vehicles from the ground up. So if you look at the Tesla, one of the brilliant things that Tesla have done is they've effectively redesigned the way cars look with a, what we call the skateboard construction. So you've got a platform with batteries very low down, you've got electric motors front and rear that are very compact, and it changes the whole packaging of the vehicle. It also changes the electrical architecture of the vehicle. And manufacturers have got to start again. You look at Volkswagen, they haven't made a Golf 8 and a Golf 9, although they've produced an electric Golf. Their real electric platform is their new ID vehicle line on the MEB platform, because they realize, you know, to do electrification properly, we've got to start again. And it's exactly the same with automation. And those two things have gone hand in hand. So manufacturers are fitting new architecture, electrical architecture, 
which enables them to put all of the sensors on the cars to enable them to deliver things like automation and over the air updates and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the new electrical architecture that automation, that electrification brings, brings a lot of other things too. So that's the reason we're getting this. And of course, you've got the vehicle manufacturers applying pressure to the regulators to say, look, we can do this, we can do this. The only reason we don't do it is the regulations are so far behind the curve. So there's a lot of pressure on the regulators to allow these vehicles onto the market and then pressure from governments to say, yes, we want these vehicles being used. Our point is they must be used safely and they must be within the consumer expectations. If it's automated, it must be fully automated. And I'm sorry, but AUKS, ALKS isn't. Okay, thank you. Um, Jack Stilgo, Professor of Science and Technology Studies uh, at UCL. Uh, you've written in a sort of, in an academic way about the issues, an accessible academic way about the issues raised by this. But, but can we take a step back? Uh, and can I ask you to take a step back and look forward? Is full autonomy coming? And do people want it? Um, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm resisting my urge as a social scientist, you know, the, so I'm a social scientist that, 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 that talks to scientists and engineers rather than a scientist or engineer myself. And our instinct is always to say it depends, which is, which is normally really unhelpful, right? Just saying it's, it, it's complicated, but in this case, I think it really does depend. So when I, when I hear full autonomy, it's essentially meaningless to me because I see machines as always dependent upon their upon their surroundings. So to Matthew's uh, Matthew characterised very nicely this sort of ladder, this these SAE levels. I would say level five was essentially impossible because driving is always is always conditional upon upon some sort of thing. So I think rather than sort of asking when we get to full autonomy, I think it's, it, it's more sensible to think about, well, what might actual self-driving systems eventually look like? What might the, the actual vehicles look like? But what might the surroundings that, that situate that vehicle uh, have to look like? So, so from, my, from my perspective, the question is, is never when self-driving, it's always where and in what form self-driving is likely to take. So, so I think full autonomy is a bit of a, is, 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 a red, is a red herring. I think it's always going to be conditioned by certain things. And I think all of the, all of the stakes of this technology are going to be in those conditions. But that, thank you, but that doesn't get me any closer to an answer to the question of whether we're ever going to live in the promised land of, uh, of, of let, let, let's, let's park for a moment the very serious uh, safety risks attached to mm. falling asleep at the wheel. Um, uh, are we going to realize in the next couple of decades any of the big uh, miraculous looking advan potential advantages in principle of autonomous driving uh, in, in which uh, they're not taking up half of, in which parked cars are not taking up half of every street, um, for example. Now, you say it, the question is, is, is where, not when. Can you hazard a guess as to where uh, that kind of advantage that, that, that uh, might, might first uh, uh, appear, the, the advantage of a family being able to summon a car from it knows not where sure sure so um i guess the, the the first thing to say is so matthew highlighted some of the sort of incremental steps that car manufacturers are taking that that might mean that their systems look increasingly automated a lot of the more sort of utopian things that you're asking about um posit a rather more radical uh, view which which says you know 
rather than a car where you're doing less and less of the driving, a computer is doing more and more of the driving. What if you were to redesign systems without drivers from the, from the ground up? And that's when you might start to see some of the more sort of radical implications of the technology. Now, are we ever going to live in the world being imagined um, in essentially, you know, these sort of hype-filled sci-fi um, views that, that we've seen a lot of? Well, well, no, we never do. But that's not that's not to say that there won't be big radical changes for some people in some places. What we've seen at the moment, even for the radical, the more radical end of things, right? A Waymo, you can't go out and buy a Waymo. But if you live in some blocks of Phoenix, Arizona, and you are one of a subgroup of users, you can dial up in effect, on an, on an Uber-type app and get into a car without a driver, which is an extraordinary thing, right? A, a, a thing that would have seemed utterly impossible 10, 20 years ago is now running around the streets of Phoenix. Um, however, you know, yeah. how, how big a change does that I, make? Yeah, I, yeah I, go just, ahead. I, I realise that there may be people on the call. Um, could you briefly explain uh, what... Waymo is and where it comes from. Uh, for, for, yeah. Because it isn't a manufacturer, is it? So Waymo is a company that originally spun out of Google. So when Google started their self-driving car project um, in the uh, round about sort of 2009-ish, um, they did a lot of the early running developing, developing these technologies. They spun out a company, Waymo, that has been testing technologies um, in, in the US. Um, and yeah, are they, they are, you know, they have a prototype system that, that, that feels a little bit like Uber to the user. So it's a, it's a, it's a ride sharing system. And the remarkable change that they made last year is that they said, well, we feel confident enough to take the driver out and to let the, uh, let the, the computer do all of the driving within, as Matthew said, this operational design domain, right? A very restricted set of circumstances. So this is not a car that can go everywhere and do everything, um, but it is nevertheless remarkable. And this comes back to your point about where, not when. It, is, am I right that it's only, you can only summon one of these in Phoenix, Arizona? Uh, yeah, as far as I know at the moment, unless something has happened in the last in the last few days that that I was I was aware of, and we should you know some people in the in the on the on this call will have been to Phoenix, Arizona, and they will know what an extraordinarily benign environment that is for driving, and it's also a pretty hostile environment if you're a pedestrian. You know, there's very little public uh, transport. Um, very few cyclists. So that tells you something about who this technology is likely to benefit, um, at least in, 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 in the shorter term. If we're going to see the sort of radical changes that might lead to you know, us being able to remove parking spaces in, in, in cities, then that suggests a very different design philosophy. And you can equally extrapolate some scenarios that look really troubling in which you have taken people off public transport, put them into self-driving cars. In addition to single occupancy vehicles, you now have the, the horror of the zero occupancy vehicle shuttling around a city and, and, and worsening congestion in a, in a sort of gloriously purposeless way. So, you know, based on your assumptions, you can, you can draw um, some scenarios that are that look, that look pretty good in terms of congestion, sustainability, efficiency, and you can draw some pretty bad scenarios too. Jack, the reason I leapt from uh, the nitty gritty of, of what Matthew described um, as what's coming imminently on the M4 or, or the M25, slow go, stop and go it, with um, a, an element of autonomy. The reason I jumped from that to the, the utopian driverlessness that was promised us um, and, and may still come 10 years hence, is that as I understood it, that um, horror of zero occupancy vehicles was actually integral to the business model of, um, uh, or at least to the sort of forward thinking of people like Tesla and Uber for slightly different reasons. That um, yes, a Model S is very expensive, but if you think that you're going to rent it out to other users for 
95% of the time, it suddenly becomes a business proposition for you, brings down the effect, effective cost and Tesla sells a lot more of them. Uh, am, I, am I wrong about that? Or, or, or is advanced autonomous still a part of the business models for the, some of the sort of leading players? I would say, you know, to, to Matthew's point, it's part of the marketing, right? And Elon Musk has, um, has gone all in on this idea that, you know, if you buy a Tesla, what you're buying is a, a future robo taxi, right? You're buying a small business for yourself. That is utterly bonkers, but is a very good way of a company establishing itself as forward looking right? That rather than when you buy a car, it losing value as soon as you leave the forecourt, that it might increase in value as it becomes more capable, right? That's, an, that's, a, that's a very persuasive story. Um, but as it is, that is, that is, just, a, that is just a story. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't say that it's part of the business model. There were... You know, Uber a few years ago were insistent that self-driving was key to its business model, right? a business model that at, at the moment subsidizes rides, um, becomes sustainable once you remove the driver from, from in effect, your, your, your taxi, and it becomes a, a, a proper functioning robo-taxi. And there we could read into the recent news that, that Uber have sold up its um, it's ATG Group that's been developing self-driving cars to another self-driving car company. Has it abandoned that vision? Well, maybe not. Maybe it will buy in that technology at a at a future date. But all of these things are, you know, symptoms of uh, an industry admitting that the problem, um, as it originally described it, is 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 rather harder once it meets reality. Thank you. That is a real scales falling from my eyes moment. I, I understand language like utterly bonkers, and I'm going to take your word for it. And I'm going to recalibrate my entire take on the Musk vision. This is quite sobering for me. Um, uh, I, I would like, if possible, uh, to come to Victoria Baines. And you, you may not want to have the, the spotlight on you, but I'm interested by the question that you're putting to Jack in, in the chat about uh, the sort of the data going into training autonomous vehicles and whether, if I understand you right, um, if you get that data from more demanding settings, you might end up with a more effective product. Do I, um, can we come to you, Victoria? And do I understand you right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to turn my camera on. I'm in a Fine. public setting and my mask on, so it's not very glamorous. But um, yeah, um, I'm just like aware of this idea that training cars in America, like America is such a predictable driving environment. Um, it's very, very clear where pedestrians cross roads, streets are very wide. Um, in comparison to um, other countries that are particularly in sort of in terms of places where cars are likely to be trained in China and India, where you might have like motorbikes scooting around um, and sort of people sort of weaving in and out of cars more and pedestrians crossing more freely. Um, I was just wondering, um, how that might impact the development of self-driving cars um, and how to respond to unexpected changes. Because the, the incident of the woman who was hit by a self-driving car, it was like the car had, didn't, hadn't seen someone walking a bike before. Um, it was either someone was on a bike or they were walking, but not walking along with a bike. Um, and yeah, the importance of making sure the autonomous vehicles training data is really, really varied, really, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Can I hear from both of you, Jack and Matthew, on this? Maybe Jack first. Is this the crash that you have written extensively about? So, yes. Yeah, so, so this is the death of Elaine Hertzberg that happened three years ago, almost to the day, actually. It was the last week was the, the, the anniversary of it, um, in which, yeah, among the, the lessons, the rather startling lessons that came out of that was, was a, um, a feature of the engineering system, which meant that the system couldn't account for pedestrians that weren't in crosswalks. So the assumption and effect of the system was that all pedestrians would be in crosswalks. And therefore, if something was not in a crosswalk, it, it, they, the system was unable to determine exactly what it was until it was, until it was too late, which tells you, you know, that, that a self-driving car will learn to drive in a very, very different way from how a human does. 
humans' capacities will be in some way adaptable. Their skills will be transferable across different environments. Um, Self-driving cars, especially based on you know, exquisitely complicated deep learning systems are data dependent. Um, so previous experience um, is, is all. Um, and there have been some people, so to your question, Victoria, there have been some people in self-driving car developers in Britain who would say the more complicated roads in London provide a better training environment and therefore a more interesting business proposition than, you know, in effect, the easy cases of places like Phoenix, Arizona. I'm actually aware of a project in Norway that sold itself on exactly these grounds, saying because Norway has some of the most challenging roads in the world, including Arctic roads from the Arctic Circle down to the south of the country where they want to transport salmon, that actually the um, the, the sort of ice road difficulty of that environment presents a uniquely interesting business opportunity. Um, I'm not sure I quite, I quite buy that argument yet, but it's interesting that the, the quality of data is becoming a consideration as well as just the quantity of data, which you know, would be Tesla's argument that, that, that sort of quantity has a quality all of its own. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, is it your experience in all the data crunching that you do that there's a, uh, a, a qualitative difference according to geography, according to where you get it from? Yeah, I think there is. Um, and it's interesting talking about the Uber crash um, because we did some work supporting the NTSB in the U US because we had tested that vehicle that was used for that, that was a Volvo XC90. We tested it for Euro NCAP and we gave it a very good rating. Now it's very important everyone understands that the system being used there was not the Volvo system. That was turned off and Uber were using their own system. But our role there was to say, right, okay, had this vehicle had an operational, the Volvo system, would it have seen the pedestrian? Uh, and the cyclist, and yes, it would. So our view on that was that the system, which wasn't an automated driving system, bear in mind, the Volvo system is a driver support system. It's actually a level zero system. It's autonomous emergency braking. But in those situations of a very partially lit pedestrian walking a bicycle, would the system have seen it a production Volvo from 2015? Yes, it would. So there was a mismatch there. And of course, one of the things highlighted in the Arizona case was the fact that you had a, um, a monitoring driver, a paid monitoring driver who wasn't looking. She didn't respond to the situation. She didn't take back control. Now, for me and for NTSB, there's a very important learning there, of course, because our expectation is that the consumers with a level three vehicle will be there monitoring the system and will be there ready to take back control. And of course, the issue is there is a paid driver from Uber and she wasn't monitoring because, you know, sitting behind an automated driving vehicle mile after mile after mile is as boring as hell. And therefore, what you do, you end up picking up your mobile phone and just doing stuff. And that, of course, is a very interesting sort of case uh, that we should then transpose to the real world with consumers behind the wheel. Now, we've done a lot of work with Uber and uh, Waymo. We know the people very well in how those systems are working. Um, and most automated driving, autonomous driving entities, those engineers will tell you that 80% of automated driving is easy. It's, all, it's almost a high school project. Making the car with sensors, understand where it is to make sure it doesn't bump into parked cars, can go round corners, can see corners. The next 10% is really quite hard. It's dealing with other traffic. So you've got road rules. It's got to understand what can I do and when can I do it? And you've got to be able to um, you know, undertake sort of quite difficult things on sort of uh, one-way streets, you know, where there's a parked car or someone coming out and how do I judge this? And they tend to be very, very um, cautious in the way they approach us. The last 10% is really, really difficult 
because it's the unexplained. It's those uh, bizarre variances of there being, you know, um, a family of ducks walking across the road. You know, what do I do with that? It's someone at a, a crossroads junction where priorities aren't very clear. It's someone who's put a few traffic bollards there, you know, students for a joke. It's these really unexplained things. The last 10% is one of the reasons why it's really, really difficult to make autonomous vehicles or automated self-driving vehicles work everywhere all of the time. So we have to think about the use case here, and we have to think about what the consumer actually wants. Now, if you ask consumers about automated vehicles, they say, great, I'd love them, I want them. And there are two things I want to do. I want to either use my mobile phone or I want to go to sleep. And that's their expectation. The other thing that consumers really want to do is they love things that are hard. They like machines to do things that are hard. So one of the very popular things and things that you'll see remarkably quickly on the market in the next two years is the automatic valley parking. The idea that you can go up to a shopping center, you can get out your car, lock it, and your car will go park yourself. There are already demonstrators uh, around this. And that new Mercedes, don't wanna, I don't wanna make too many adverts for Mercedes, but that new Mercedes, has got that feature built in. It's got a level four valley parking system. Now it requires the infrastructure. It can't work on every car park, only certain car parks, but that technology is coming around the corner because that is a relevant use case that consumers want. So whilst you've got the theoretical, can I drive everywhere? Can I make this machine drive? What's the actual expectation from the consumer? And the final point I just want to cover, which goes a little bit back to your question, sorry, I've di diversed a bit, but is um, around how you train a automated vehicle. And what traditionally you do at the moment is you look at all the crashes that you have on the, on the roads and they're well documented and you understand, right, what did the person do wrong here? Why did that crash occur? We have to make sure that we engineer the vehicle to address this sort of crash scenario. The problem we're not always doing is understanding what makes good driving. Although we get blamed, humans get blamed for 90% of all crashes, actually humans are really, really good at driving. It's a complicated thing mm -hmm. to come to crossroads with cars and those ducks walking across the road and all that complexity. And humans negotiate this really, really well. And that's one of the challenges that what is uh, understanding what is good driving and the constant negotiation that you do that I'm sure Jack understands better than I do probably, but the constant negotiation that you do as a driver with other drivers, understanding what can I do? What shouldn't I do? You know, what can I get away with? You know, if, if the right of way isn't very clear, you know, do you sort of nip ahead, you know, of the car in front because, you think I can just sort of the most efficient way of me negotiating this hazard. And it's those complexities that are very, very difficult and getting machines to do that is very, very complicated. Right. Um, in, a, in a minute, I want to go back, zoom back to uh, th with the 2016 Hertzberg crash and ask Jack uh, why it's so significant, and why you wrote at length about it. But while we're on this valet parking, I mean, we can't just let that go because that is just brilliant. Um, and you say, I want to, can you sketch out um, how that would work? I own a Mercedes S class. Um, I'm going on holiday in October. I show up at Gatwick. I get what, uh, and what happens? Well, I think the idea uh, is. Um, you, you get to the Gatwick car park, which is the automated Gatwick car park. You turn up and you and you stop your car. You get out of it, lock it, take your bags with you and your car goes away. And then when you get off your flight and come out of the terminal, you press the button on probably your mobile phone. Your car wakes up, negotiates through this 16 storey car park all the way down and appears in front of you, doors open, put your bags in, off you go. And there's lots of models around this, around shopping precincts. And when you ask the consumers but about how far that, are we? How far are we in regulatory terms from allowing that to happen? 
in regulatory terms, you could do it today. You and in technical terms? The manufacturer could introduce something to that because it's on private land. The oh. vehicle is being used on private land. So as long as the arrangement between Mercedes and NCP, for example, that you can do that and it's in a safe environment. It's very simple. It's very benign. And today, uh, manufacturers like Tesla and, Merce and Mercedes have got, have got parking apps on their phone. So you can remote control and drive your car, for instance, onto your drive. So let's say you've got a, a difficult drive to negotiate and there's very little room to open the doors. You can buy a Mercedes or a Tesla today and use that app. You can get out of your car, press the button on your phone, and your car with no one in it will move the maneuver the vehicle into your tight garage spot or wherever it is. So this technology is, is here today. And of course, it's, it's very safe. It's very, very controlled because it's working at low speed. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we go to Jack, let, let's just take a look at the chat. Um, Ralph Lucas is, is saying that you, which I guess is us, seem to be making this all much harder than it should be. Why think of autonomy for cars, do it for shuttles on predictable routes and evolve the technology from there? Was there anything further you wanted to say about that, Ralph? Are, are, are you aware of examples of, of where that's happening or could happen? And I'm sorry, I know it takes a couple of minutes to get to you. Uh, um, or a couple of seconds, I should say. But um, can we go to Ralph? Sorry, Connor, I should have given you advance notice. Maybe not. Can I, d d Giles, yeah, can I just, just because there was a, a, a similar question in there as well from, from Luke who said, why not put the intelligence into the road rather than into the vehicle? And I think that they're, they're, they're sort of similar questions because they're about, you know, how would you design the whole system from the ground up, right? And and the answers there are often quite boring. You know, in London, we have two big driverless systems. We have the Docklands Light Railway and the Victoria Line. Um, and they work because they are designed as as whole systems and they've worked for for, for decades. So... I mean, there's a sort of, well, obviously, yes, you, you could do that. And it's also worth knowing that the history of self-driving since the 1950s has actually, until very recently, been a history of smart roads rather than smart cars. So a lot of the experiments that, that were done in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s were about designing infrastructures that would enable drivers to be able to, to, to switch off. And it's only really with the recent hype about artificial intelligence and robotics that the focus has become the vehicle itself as a, as a computational device rather than seeking to design the whole system. Can you, what do you mean by uh, roads or infrastructure that enable self-driving? So I, mean, I understand the DLR example. Yeah. So the, the I mean, the, the, the sorts of things that the, the people were developing in the early days were roads with magnetic strips running down the middle of them where you just ask the car to follow to follow that strip. But equally, you know, thinking about self-driving, the sorts of models that that Matthew was describing, you could you could easily condition a self-driving system and you would say, well, it can operate in circumstances where there are not going to be horses, bikes, uh, bikes, pedestrians. So, you know, let's have a motorway only system. And that if in effect is a, is a system design question rather than an artificial intelligence problem. Thanks. I, I see we have uh, got Ralph. Uh, can we come to you and yes. uh, do, do you have, um, can you put some flesh on the bones of the idea of, of approaching this from another angle? Well, I think we're trying to uh, automate from the very hardest end, which is an individual who owns their own car. Uh, if we start from uh, a publicly owned vehicle on a restricted route and circumstances where that is, uh, that is advantageous, such as, well, I live in Eastbourne, public transport doesn't work in Eastbourne, it's too diffuse, uh, an on-demand autonomous system would work, um, or we can get a shuttle from the middle of town up to Beachy Head and beyond, uh, which would really deal with a lot of uh, local pollution problems. You know, you can, you can take a problem on a very restricted environment, uh, on a very well-controlled vehicle with what you're talking about, you know, an intelligent 
road that knows when a shuttle's approaching and adjusts the lights accordingly and so on and so forth. Go for, go for the easiest problem you can. Uh, get something going so that people get used to the, the situation. And I, and I think we're, we're making life too hard for ourselves on this. And talking to CCAV, they certainly see... Remind us what CCAV stands for. Oh, you can probably remind me better. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the government... For connected and automated vehicles. It's, 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 uh, it's an email address to me. They, 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 I think they see uh, draft regulations in a couple of years' time for that sort of application, but, one, but there, is a, there is a route through that. Thank you very much. Um, Jack, doesn't that sound eminently sensible? Uh, define your sort of playpen and uh, build something that works within that. And isn't that in fact what Waymo is doing in Phoenix? Well, it, it, it sort of is. I mean, it's a, so if Waymo are coming at it from the rather different end, which is to say, let's design a vehicle and then see what playpen would be appropriate rather than designing the playpen and the vehicle at, at the same time. The, the, the question for Waymo is how do you make that playpen bigger, right? How do you expand what they call the geofence, the, the boundaries around their, around, around their zone? And there's some potentially interesting debates to be, to be had there. And you could say, to, so to Ralph's point about designing you know, fixed routes and, and, and getting something that, that works there. The question then of how you expand the fixed routes becomes a rather diff different one. But for, I mean, for example, in, in closed environments, this becomes a relatively simple problem. And they've been doing it at Heathrow for a while. They've had very low speed driverless shuttles um, in Heathrow on, uh, on, on private land where they know that you know, nothing's gonna, gonna wander into that way. It's, it's, it's not very exciting technology Right, it's it's Elon Musk would not would not get too exercised by this, but you know it's the sort of thing that in the rather more boring version of the self driving future we might see quite a lot of. Jack, I said I'd come back to you on the subject of the Elaine Hertzberg crash. What does that tell us that's important about the dis the difference between Tesla's approach to this and other people's approach to it? Um, so, well, let's not confuse. So, so Tesla have themselves been involved in lots of crashes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Elaine Hertzberg was uh, run over by a vehicle operated by Uber. Um, and what that tells you, well, I, I think the sort of the lesson that Uber learned from it, or oh, one, I mean, that maybe is, is, is optimistic because it remains to be seen whether Uber have learned this lesson. But um, the NTSB report, the NTSB, the organization that, that Matthew mentioned, um, identified a, a range of causes for that crash that I think we should, we should pay attention to. So it's easy to say that crash was caused by X, right? A crash is never caused by one thing. They're the product of, of some complicated systems. So when Elaine Hertzberg got killed, um, I think the, the, the causes of that crash tell us something really important about how self-driving cars are going to be governed. For, for one thing, Uber's safety culture was pretty rotten, which allowed for the hiring of a safety driver that you know, was not up to her job, as, as, as Matthew described. But also, um, Uber were there operating on the roads of Arizona because they'd been invited there by a governor who was more interested in having flashy new things running around on his roads than in asking any questions about how the technology is going to be safe and beneficial for, for his community. So I think it tells you something really quite problematic about a sort of bias towards innovation for innovation's sake. Um, rather than asking what the innovation um, might be for, and those are, you know, those are some of the sort of non-technical causes, and we we can go into, you know, yeah. why the vehicle didn't pick up that that there was a bicycle and a, and a woman crossing the road in front of it. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. We're unfortunately nearly out of time. Um, I wanted uh, before we end this session to ask both of you for your. 10 years hence vision, and perhaps referring to the question that we gave ourselves at the beginning, uh, as, which I'll paraphrase, to what extent is this, is this all hype? I'm getting the impression that technologically, it's not hype at all. Um, if, if I can do valet parking in my Mercedes S-Class, uh, 
imminently. But um, how much are, um, let, let's start with Matthew and then I'll have to ask you both to keep it brief. Uh, and then back to Jack, uh, are, we, are we going to be doing other things than driving behind the wheel 10 years hence? Yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a momentum there. Um, I think we've, again, we've got to consider the use case and I think the market will evolve. I think there is a novelty factor. You'll get in the car and you, you'll see that, you know, I can press the button and I can watch TV. Um, but there's going to be a novelty factor and there's also going to be a cost to it because you are going to be restricted to what you can do within the vehicle's entertainment system. You'll probably pay the privilege of doing that. You're not going to be able to sit there with your own iPad. And so I think there's going to be limitations to that. And I think with any of this technology, it will find its level. So mm. things like automatic valley parking, yes, you'll see that. I think you'll see full automation by the middle of this decade. And I think some people will enjoy using it like they use ACC today. Other people will say, well, I get it, but the limitations are such that, you know, I'll just keep on driving myself. And the good thing in terms of road safety, which is where I'm coming from, is, of course, the systems that are used to control the vehicle are working 24-7 to prevent the vehicle colliding, even if you're doing the driving. So the roads get safer, whether you're using automation or not. Great. Thank you. Um, Jack? What, how much will we be not driving behind the wheel 10 years hence? So for me as a social scientist, my, my question when it comes to new technologies is always who benefits, right? Because I, I think the existence of a technology is a relatively unimportant thing compared to the, the benefits of that technology being, being widespread. So I guess my question is, do I see the sorts of things that Matthew just described trickling down to be you know, the sorts of devices that become everyday in vehicles that aren't just high end. Um, I mean, perhaps that has been the, mod the model for other sort of safety uh, technologies, but you might find that that just makes, you know, people who drive a lot relatively just a bit more comfortable and, 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 and a bit safer. You could say that we all benefit from improvements in road safety. I mean, one thing that we haven't said uh, very much. We've been rather complimentary about about cars, but actually, cars are a public health disaster. Right, a million people, more than a million people, dying a year because of cars is is not something to be to be sniffed at. So, if there could be dents made in that, then that would be great. But you know, most of those deaths are happening in poor countries where the technology is unlikely to make a difference um, in 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 ten years. Then, I think you have a question of you know, whether there will be driverless systems that um, allow, for example, a city to radically overhaul its public transport and open up mobility to, um, to other people. Yes, maybe in certain places, in certain, in certain conditions. But again, I think the conditionality is going to be is going to be all um, here. So I'm afraid it's a rather a rather pessimistic story from me. I see sort of pockets of the technology um, solving certain problems, but I don't see the technology making a big difference to millions of people's lives um, that quickly. And you also see the Tesla uh, sales pitch is utterly bonkers. So that's one of the things that I've taken away from this hour. Um, thank you both very much. Thank you, everybody who's been really busy in the chat. Too busy, I confess, for me to keep track of. I note uh, Tina has been exceptionally busy picking up on the idea of automated car parks um, uh, and, and dissing the idea of um, dull roller coasters. I'm assuming, Tina, that you're referring to um, Heathrow's um, uh, already driverless shuttles. But the question that we started with was whether this is hype or real. And Matthew has made the point very clearly and with great granularity that um, this is real. It's coming very soon. It's going to come incrementally and it will it will find its own level. Um, Matthew and Jack, you have somewhat different views on, I, I think, the sort of potential and potential potential for uptake. I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to choose to be uh, gung-ho still at the end of the hour uh, on the basis that governments 
and manufacturers and insurers are all um, in certain uh, places anyway on the same side and, and, and consumers, Matthew, as you point out, very keen to have AI and, and a robot under the hood doing the hard work for them. So um, we will take on board, Jack, your caveats, but we'll go forward to the next session, which starts in five minutes. Thank you both, Matthew and Jack and everybody else very much. Mm -hmm.